And most of us don't think about that, but what you feed your mind is just as important as what you feed your body. Now, the kind of books we read, the people we associate with, the music we listen to, the television program we watch, the movies we go to, our mental diet. Be careful because what we feed our mind influence our total health and well-being. Now, you, 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 you can't look at a person and tell what they are feeding their mind because they're serial killers. They are living next door to somebody. They're going to school or in college or they're working. You don't know what they're feeding their mind. They look ordinary, like ordinary people. But when they do what they do, people say, I just didn't know they were doing it. But they have, if, you, if they go in, when the FBI get their note and look on their computers, they see that they've been contemplating this for a long time. But the people didn't know it because you don't know what's in people's mind. The devil can drop stuff in your mind and have you feel feeding on that junk and have you get into a pattern in your life where you're totally useful in most things and you don't even realize it because your mind have become conditioned to accept yes, garbage sir. and trash and you're mad at folks and you don't even know why you're mad at them. You're angry and don't know why you're angry. You think everybody against you and nobody is against you. But all of that stuff have blotted your mind up and you can't allow the Holy Spirit to get through because it's too much of junk in your mind. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and, and so, dear brethren, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice, holy, the kind he can accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh renewing in, your, in you. Do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his will, how his ways will realize, will really satisfy you. A lot of time when we get junk in our mind and our mind is cluttered, we can't allow God to have his way in our mind. We have conditioned ourselves to do whatever we want. And all this year, and yet, all of this year, we've been dealing with uh, uh, following God's agenda and not our own. And some have never still haven't got on God's agenda. They still doing what they was doing. They still operating the same way. Still don't care what they do. You know, it, what I do is what I do and God knows my heart. That's the biggest problem you have. God knows your heart. He knows your heart. And that's where you, you, your mistake is at. When sacrificing according to God's law, a priest would kill the animal, cut it in pieces, and place it on the altar. Sacrifice was important. But even in the Old Testament, God made it clear that obedience from the heart was much more important than sacrifice. Much more important than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 5, 22, the life application, Samuel replied, has the Lord as much pleasure in your burnt offering and sacrifice as in your obedience? Obedience is far better than sacrifice. He is much more interested in your listening to him than your offering the fat of rams to him to him. Psalm 40 and 6, it isn't sacrifice and offering. Uh, it, it isn't it sacrifice and offering which you really want from your people? Born animals bring no special joy to your heart, but you have accepted the offering of my lifelong service. So service to God, all of us have to learn to bend. To bend. Bend mean that you can bend without breaking. And so a lot of time, God have to bend us and get and before he straighten us out because we have been the wrong way. We have, we've turned and let the devil pull us over this way or pull us that way or got us backwards and God want to straighten us up. Now, when you straighten something up and bend it back up, it hurts because you may not want to be bent the way God wants you to be bent. You may not want to shape up the way God wants you to shape up, but God wants the whole church to shape up because the church is bent out of place. There's a way that seemed right unto God, but the way in there are is what? 
is death. And so we have to understand that to keep death out, we got to allow God to mold us and shape us. God sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house and he sent him there and showed him that the potter was making vessels and he was spinning them on the wheel. But when one came out wrong, he had to mar it back into his hands and start it all over again. I really believe in my heart that God has said to the church, get back on the wheel. Get back on the wheel. You've been molded and shaped and you allowed this world to shape you and mold you into a frame that I don't want. You're not praising me the way that I, you used to praise me. You're not praying. Do y'all understand? And somebody may say I come back fussing. I'm not fussing. This message came to me this morning. The message that I wrote for this day, God took it away. He took it away and he gave me this this morning, Elder William, that we need to be molded and shaped the way he wants us to be shaped and stop trying to do our own agenda. It's hurting you and it's hurting your family. You're wondering why things are not going right. You're wondering why things are not lining up. Check yourself. Give yourself a brain examination. Examine your brain, your mind. Examine what you're allowed to come in. Examine do you love like you used to love. Examine how your prayer life is. If you can't come to prayer one time a week, one time a month, examine what's going on in your heart. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. It's all right. I'm not looking for amen this morning because I told God, I said, God, this is going to be a tough one. But I told, also told God that I'm not trying to preach anymore to please anybody. I only somebody I want to preach for the rest of my life is God and my wife. That's the truth. I'm, you know, you reach your age, well, you, you ought to be telling the truth and not trying to please nobody. God wants us to offer ourselves daily, laying aside our own desires to follow him. Put all our energy and resources at his disposal and transition him to guide us. Are you, are you really giving God, God have a right of way in your heart? Do God say something and you, whatever your agenda is, you lay it aside for God's? Think about that. And if you say you are and you know you're not, you're lying and God going to hold you responsible for that. He is. I'm telling the truth. I'm trying to help somebody. He, we do this out of, do we do this out of gratitude that our sins have been forgiven? Verse 2 says, and, and I'm still in, and, and, and this is what Amon said. He said, God hates. Help me say, God hates. Uh, 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 he, I hate your show and pretense. Your hypocrisy are honoring me with your religious feasts and solemn assembly. I will not accept your born offering and thanks offering. I will not look at your offering of peace. Away with your hymns of praise. They are mere noise to my ears. I will not listen to your music, no matter how lovely it is. I want to see a mighty flood of justice and a tolerance of doing good. This is the word of God. A tolerance of doing good. Lord, I need some help here. God wants us to offer ourselves daily, laying aside our own desires to follow him and put all our energy and resources at his disposal and trust him to guide us. We do this out of gratitude that our sins have been forgiven. And God is telling us in verse 2, uh, uh, he tells us, God, have good ex God, good, uh, God has good, acceptable, and perfect plan for us. He wants us to be transformed people with renewed mind living to honor and obey him he only wants what is best for us because he gave his son to make our new our life new possible we should joyfully give ourselves as living sacrifice for his servant yes. look what he did his son gave his life yes, now he gave his life for folks that don't care about him he gave his life for people that got an attitude they can do what they want. They've been in the church a long time, and yet they still won't bend. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, well, he talking to me. I sure am. <laughs> Christians are called not to conform to the world with his behaviors and custom that are usually self and selfish and corruption, corruptible. Many Christians widely decide that worldly behavior is off limit for them. Our refusal to conform to this world values, however, must be deeper 
than behavior and custom. It must firmly planted, be firmly planted in our mind to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we have to have God's word formally planted in our mind. We have to get where we are live for God, regardless of what other people say, regardless of what my neighbor thinks, regardless of what my friend thinks, I'm going to live for God. Because you got to die by yourself. Let me tell you, you're not going to die for what your friend thinks. You, when you die, you got to die by yourself. So you got to live by, for God for yourself, for yourself only. We got to get off of this. The church is, do you understand what God want to bless us? And I keep telling you, God want to bless you. But you're holding it back. You're holding back like blessing for the church. You're standing in the way. You're on the cord. Get off the cord. It is possible to avoid most worldly custom and still be proud, covetous, selfish, stubborn, and arrogant. Only when the Holy Spirit renew, rededicate, or re-educate, and redirect our minds we are transformed. Transform. Be ye transformed. By the what? Renewing. By renewing your mind. Renew me to make new. That means that if you renew it, you don't think like you used to think. You don't think that, uh, you know, this person, I almost jumped on this person. I wanted to curse him out. You curse him out anyway. You wanted to do it. So a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So when you wanted to do it, you already cursed him. No, that's the truth. Well, if that's not the truth, then Jesus lied. And when he said, if, if, if you think about adultery in your heart, you've already committed it. Yes, sir. Didn't he say that? Yes, sir. So if you're thinking about jumping on him, you already done did. The, you, you done committed the sin. All right, Amen. So your mind has to be renewed. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1 uh, through 8, and this is the Life Application Bible. Is there any such thing as Christians cheering each other up? Do you love me enough to to want to help me. Does it mean anything to you that we are brothers in the Lord, sharing the same spirit? Are your heart tender and sympathetic to all? Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. When we came to Christ, we said to him, God, if you would forgive me for all of my sins and save me, I will serve you until I die. That was a vow. That was like marriage, the deaf one. When you said, I, would, I love you, I would cherish her, cherish him until death do us apart. You said that was a vow. It was sealed. Deaf one. When you said to Jesus Christ, if you come into my heart and save me, I would obey you and I love you until right. I die. I'll serve you to the best of my knowledge. That was a vow. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes, it's best not to make a vow That's right. than to make it and break it. Yes, sir. That's why he said that the backslider, the backslide, that's a hard life because you broke a vow. You broke a vow. You said you would be faithful. You said that you would serve Jesus. And, and now you broke the vow. So when you, but we call it backsliding, but it's actually uh, uh, di drop, drop from grace. You, you took the grace, saying that God, grace, we're going to get you out of everything. You got to watch this teaching. Uh, you got to watch this teaching because the people that are teaching that grace is going to bring you out of everything. And you can do anything now since grace is going to cover you. Grace does not cover you like that. God said in Romans uh, 6 and 1, says, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God said no. God says no. So you can listen to all this stuff, but some of you, gonna, if you don't stop at hell, you're going to go to hell. People don't tell you you're going to hell. They're the hell, and hell is just as real as heaven. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just as real as heaven. And you know, God is really good, even though you, you do wrong and you're going to go to hell for, doing, going to, for sin, because he said no sin shall inherit the kingdom of God. He told you that adultery, fornication, all that stuff is not going to inherit it. And you saying, you going with what man said, but once you in, grace got you covered and you can never be lost. And then the man, he going to hell too. But God is good enough that he's going to let you come before him and stand before him and give account what you did in your body. But he said, a liar you won't eat. I'm not going to even talk to you. You lied all the ways anyway. I ain't going to even hear you. You lied on yourself. You said you're going to do this and didn't do it. So I won't even hear you. Don't even show your face. What is some strict gospel? But it's right. It's right because, you know, I see it 
And sometimes I, I, I have to turn the station because you look at some of these television programs, it mess you up. It'll mess you up. And these are big name folks, and you think because they have a big name that what they say is right. And but sometimes, you, if you, you not notice this, that the televangelist never preaches a message like I'm preaching to you now. They always preach something to get to your emotions. Because at the end, they want to sell their tapes and their yes. records. And I don't have nothing against that. But they've almost outpriced the common person. When they get through, it's $150, uh, two or $300 for a book and, and some CDs. Come on, Ellen. And so now they're preaching to a different scale of people. Uh, and, 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 and the average person, if you would write them and tell them to send you a CD and a book, see how many they're going to send you. But yet, if, if we come to your tithes and offerings, supporting the person that is, is here with you, laboring with you, going to bury you, bury your family, bury your son or whatever, marry you and so forth, and then you, 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 you have the audacity to go and spend money at a restaurant and sit down and talk about leaders that is helping you and, and, and money that you wouldn't even put in church, and you'll spend, you go spend $30 yakking and tacking and da-da, all that stuff, and then you come to church and give a dollar. That's the, do you understand you are cluttered up? Do you understand your mind is messed up and you're on your way to hell of destruction? How, then you, when something gets happened, you want everybody to pray for your son, get him out, pray for your daughter, pray for your cousin, pray. Who have you been praying for? You reap what you sow. God, they don't like this type of teaching. But, 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 but Philippians says, he said, is there any such thing as Christians cheering each other up? Do you love me enough to want to help me? Does it mean anything to you that we are brothers in the Lord sharing the same spirit? Are your heart tender and sympathetic at all? Verse 2 said, uh, then make me truly happy by loving each other and agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, working together with one heart, one mind, one purpose. Many people, even Christian, lie, live only to make a good impression on others or to please themselves, but selfish ambition or conceit being discord. Paul, therefore, stressed spiritual unity. He asked the Philippians to love one another and to be one in the spirit and purpose. Is that too much to ask you to love one another? Is that too much to ask the church to love one another? Is it too much to ask the church to love the brethren? Is it too much to ask the church to come to midweek service? Is it too much to ask you to fast and pray? Is it too much to ask you to come to prayer? Is it, you all not have to beg folks to come to prayer. I don't care if you have to get up early in the morning. I don't care if it's late at night. If something happened to you, I declare you'll get up early in the morning. Something happened to your family, I declare you'll pray all night. But yet the Bible said, man, ought always pray. If not, he's going to faint. And that word faint means get weak. You're going to lose strength. Because when a person faint, they lose strength and they fall out. So that's what happened. Now, now, when we work together, caring for the problems of others, as if they were our problem, we demonstrate Christ's example of putting others first, and we experience unity. Let us not be so concerned about making a good impression or meeting our need that we uh, that, we that we strain relationship in God's family. In other words, we, we want to make a, such an impression for folks to see us that we strain our relationship with the family. We want to be top. We want to be top. You know, and sometimes it's even a problem to bring in new folks and, and let them work because you, you are like a cow at the haystack, uh, a dog at the haystack. You, don't, you ain't going to eat the hay, but you don't want nobody else to have it. But I got seniority. I've been here. I thought you've been here. But what have you done while you was here? Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Self-ambition can ruin a church, but genuine humility can build it up. Being humble involves having a true perspective about yourself. Romans 12 and 3, we are laying aside selfishness and treating others as respect and with respect and common courtesy. Be nice to other folks. Be kind to other folks. That's why I was telling my brother, you want friend, you got to show yourself friendly. 
You can't stay at home and don't go to church and don't visit anybody, don't call anybody, and don't talk with your brothers and sisters and wonder why you feel lonely. That's a mental problem. Don't just think about your own affairs. Be innocent in others too and in what they are doing. Philippian uh, was, uh, 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 the Philippi was a cosmetology city. It had many nationalities and a variety of languages were spoken. The church reflected the variety of communities and the diversity. There were many people with various background, various background, and walk, in, uh, and walk of life. The church were made up of Jews, con Jewish converts and many other ethnicities of people. Lida was a wealthy businesswoman, a convert from Asia. With, no, with so many different backgrounds among the members, unity must have been difficult to maintain, although there is no evidence of division in the church. Paul had all of these different ethnicity in the church, but you don't find where there was any division in it. Where there was division was in the current church. In the Corinthian church, Paul said, and these were all Jewish converts, and they, he said, there's, there's division among you. You are babes. He said, you should be eating meat, but instead of eating meat, I got to feed you with milk. Do you understand? As I shouldn't be have to preach messages like this because most of you should be eating meat. Most of you should be faithful. Most of you should be here when church starts, but you're not. Most of you should be here when it starts. You know what time it starts. You're not a baby. Nobody has to burp you. No, no, God, they don't like it, but I'm preaching it. Unity has to be safe. Got it. Paul encouraged us to guard against any selfish prejudice or jealousy that might lead to dissension. We must show genuine interest in our members and not allow our mind to be filled with a lot of strange thoughts. Look at somebody and ask them, what are you thinking? Right now you're thinking you're mad at me. Your attitude should be the kind that showed that was shown by Jesus Christ. Jesus was willing to give up his right and order to obey God and serve God. Remember what Jesus said? Father, can you deliver me from this? If it's your will. But nevertheless, anybody remember that? But nevertheless, not what? But do we have a church to say nevertheless? Or you have a church that says, no, I don't make no difference. I'm going to do what, I, what I'm going to do. Do we have a nevertheless church? I'm tired, but nevertheless. I didn't wear myself. I didn't get tired of God working for you. I got tired doing stuff that I wanted to do. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Your attitude should be the kind that's shown by Jesus Christ. Verse 6, but lay aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. And the armor himself, if even, he humbled himself even further, gone so far, actually to die as a criminal death on the cross. That's what Jesus did. He went that far for us. That's how much he loved us. Yeah. Nevertheless, your will be done, not mine, your will. Do you understand God is working to get us back to that? Yes, sir. God does not. And that's why when God gave me the theme for this year, making my agenda his, he said to me, and I've told you all so many times, God does not count numbers. He make numbers count. One is God. Six is the number of man. If you read your Bible, Revelation says 666. That's the number of man. The devil is a man, a spiritual man, a deceiving man. And he had the number in his head, 666. So what God was saying to man, get on my agenda. Get on my agenda, and I'll bless you. I got, it's, it's your time for blessing. It's 
2016. The number 20 is the number for reform, change. 21 is three times seven. We're coming into 2017. So 2017, you got one, now you got a new beginning. Eight is a new beginning, but seven is a completion. And the year seven, when you see seven, seven was a day that Jesus, God rested. It doesn't mean that God sat down. It means that God was finished. And remember, he said in, in every seven years, there is a different thing. Yes. If you look at your life, every seven years, something happened different. Yes. Seven years, you just look at it. Every seven years, you either made some progress or you're falling back into something that you should, be, should, have, God have, should have brought you out of. Seven years, you should be prospering. Seven years, my ministry changed. I noticed it myself. You may not even notice, but my ministry changed the first of this year. The first of this year, my ministry changed. What I'm saying changed. It didn't change from Scripture. It, 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 what changed is that I understand Ella Roberts much more now. Yeah. I, I don't have to, Ella William, I don't have to go to the Greek and, and, and research words now with the etymology of words now like I used to because now God puts them in my heart and, and they are there and I can my recall is better at 68 than it y'all ain't gonna talk to me right. but it's better at 68 than it was when I was in my 60s yeah. see I had seven years that's what I had to look at I had to look at seven years at uh, uh, seven years that God you know I had some turmoil 60 1960 uh, coming when I got 60 years old well I had a, I had a stroke First time I had a stroke on my, on my side over here. When I was 60, 61, I had this leg operated on. They had to take a vein from my, my uh, thigh and run it down to my feet. 62, they had to do the same thing to this leg. 63, uh, 64, I had gallbladder taken out. And 65, uh, I, I, I lost half of my, and, and when I was 66, I lost half of my blood. 65, half of my blood came out of my body. Now God said, I'm renewing you. My God, do you understand? These last couple of years, God has given me strength that I didn't have. Y'all remember for three years I didn't sweat. Now I'm sweating again. All of these things. It is my time. And I'm going to tell you that if you get on God's agenda, God will bless you. Things are happening to me that's just like sometimes it's impossible. And one of the things my brother told me, he said, you may not believe me. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, you got another one more year to go and God going to bless you. God had already told me this, but he told me, he said, God going to bless you more than you ever been blessed. He said, you, you don't even know where it's coming from. And I told him, I said, I know that's true. I've already accepted it. Do you understand? God can confirm things with you. But don't be upset because I'm preaching to you. Don't be mad. Celebrate. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to take you with me. I don't want to go by myself. But on the other hand, you don't want to go. Don't hear to me. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus chose to become a man so he could condemn sin in the flesh. Sin always starts in the mind. Look at somebody says, always start in the mind. If you notice, everything starts in the mind. A person look at you, it starts in the mind. Somebody say something to you, your mind interpreted it wrong. Or it always starts in the mind. They don't like me. Or they said this about me. It always starts in the mind. Your mind need to be renewed. Your mind need to be overhauled. You need to get that trash and that junk out of your mind and get out of your mind. You got to rebuttal. Every time somebody say something you don't like, you got to rebuttal. That's Donald Trump problem. That's his problem. He can't control his mind. Every time somebody says something, he got to say something back at him. He got to put a label on them. He got to call them crooked. He got to call them hateful. He got to call them all of these things. But do you understand? So a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Listen, I don't have to rebuttal a fool because it takes as long for me to rebuttal as it does to pray. And I'd rather pray and keep my mind clean than go to a fool that talked about me and try to straighten it out. Do you understand? You're wasting time trying to straighten out somebody that's never going to like you. Finally. Finally. But who is a Christian? 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. Who isn't a Christian can't understand, just talking about the natural man, and can't accept these thoughts from God, which the Holy Spirit teaches us. 
They sound foolish to them because only those who have the Holy Ghost within them can understand what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches us. They sound foolish to him because only those who have the Holy Spirit within them can understand what the Holy Spirit means. Others just can't take it. Isn't it strange? Watch, I'm going to show you how the devil does, Dr. Brown. We can go to the movie, a game, uh, something else, a comic to show, whatever, and we can enjoy ourselves better than we do in the church. 